The Public Theater, New York City, April 5th, 1982. This is a record of the event, as performers and writers, Donald Barthelme, Thomas Gates, Jack Guilford, Richard Gilman, what could possibly be wrong with those books? One of them asked me. Andre Gregory. The point is obvious. There is more than one way to burn a book. Margaret Hamilton. Right. Nat Hentoff. Dangerous, wretched writers. The censors. Jamaka Highwater. Missionaries. John Irving. That he should still have enemies among the self righteous should make Hawthorne in his grave very proud. Book is very intensely Erica Jong. June Jordan. Toni Morrison. To deny a child an extraordinary book like Invisible Man, a classic, because of three phrases, is all but madness. Grace Paley. Estelle Parsons. John Simon. Scott Spencer. Gay Talese. And Calvin Trillin appear in An Evening of Forbidden Books. A packed theater listened for almost three hours to readings from some of the over 100 titles that are presently banned in scores of local schools and libraries in many American communities. The event is organized by the American branch of Penn, an international writers organization dedicated to the defense of free expression and the preservation of the world's literatures. One issue is free access to books of all kinds. Tonight we launch a new project of Penn, the American Right to Read. This project had its inception in a realization on the part of many Penn members that while blows against freedom of expression may be more severe in other countries than they have been here, we have been receiving them too. The famous writers and performers gathered here have come to protest the fact that since early 1981, the number of books removed from public library shelves and school reading lists across America by a variety of persons and groups has increased by 500 percent. Tonight they speak out, sometimes with anger, sometimes with humor, sometimes with quiet persuasion. Andre Gregory opens the evening with Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, one of the banned books. In an afterward, Bradbury tells of his own experience with censorship. About two years ago, a letter arrived from a solemn young Vassar lady telling me how much she enjoyed reading my experiment in space mythology, The Martian Chronicles. But she added, wouldn't it be a good idea this late in time to rewrite the book inserting more women's characters and roles? A few years before that, I got a certain amount of mail concerning the same Martian book, complaining that the blacks in the book were Uncle Tom's and why didn't I do them over? Along about then came a note from a southern white suggesting that I was prejudiced in favor of the blacks and the entire story should be dropped. Some five years back, the editors of yet another anthology for school readers put together a volume with some 400 count em short stories in it. How do you cram 400 short stories by Twain, Irving, Poe, Maupassant, and Bierce into one book? Simplicity itself. Skin, debone, demarrow, scarify, melt, render down, and destroy. Every adjective that counted, every verb that moved, every metaphor that weighed more than a mosquito, out. Every simile that would have made a submoron's mouth twitch, gone. Any aside that explained the two-bit philosophy of a first-rate writer, lost. Every story, slenderized, starved, blue-penciled, leached, and bled white, resembled every other story. Twain read like Poe, read like Shakespeare, read like Dostoevsky, read like in the finale, Edgar Guest. Every word of more than three syllables had been razored, every image that demanded so much as one instant's attention, shot dead. Do you begin to get the damned and incredible picture? The point is obvious. There is more than one way to burn a book, and the world is full of people running about with lit matches. Every minority, be it Baptist, Unitarian, Irish, Italian, Octogenarian, Zen Buddhist, Zionist, Seventh-day Adventist, Women's Lib, Republican, Mattachine, 
Foursquare gospel feels it has the will, the right, the duty to douse the kerosene, light the fuse. Every dimwit editor who sees himself as the source of all dreary, blank, mange, plain, porridge, unleavened literature licks his guillotine and eyes the neck of any author who dares to speak above a whisper or write above a nursery rhyme. Fire Captain Beatty in my novel, Fahrenheit 451, described how the book... <laughs> Fire! <laughs> That's a sign from God. <clears throat> Fire Captain Beatty in my novel, Fahrenheit 451, described how the books were burned, first by minorities, <laughs> till each ripping a page or a paragraph from this book then that until the day came when the books were empty and the mines shut and the libraries closed forever. Shut the door, they're coming through the window. Shut the window, they're coming through the door are the words to an old song. They fit my lifestyle with newly arriving butcher censors every month. If Mormons do not like my plays, let them write their own. If the Irish hate my Dublin stories, let them rent typewriters. If teachers and grammar school editors find my jawbreaker sentences shatter their mush milk teeth, let them eat stale cake dunked in weak tea of their own ungodly manufacture. In sum, do not insult me with the beheadings, finger choppings, or the lung deflations you plan for my works. I need my head to shake or nod, my hand to wave or make into a fist, my lungs to shout or whisper with. I will not go gently unto a shelf, degutted to become a non-book. All you umpires, back to the bleachers. Referees, hit the shower. It's my game. I pitch, I hit, I catch, I run the bases. At sunset, I've won or lost. At sunrise, I'm out again, giving it the old try. And no one can help me, not even you. Thank you. I'm proud to uh, represent tonight the treasury of American poetry, which had the misfortune to carry a poem of mine getting down to get over in a poem by Allen Ginsberg, How, on the basis of which uh, the good people in Gretna, Virginia saw fit to remove the treasury of American poetry. So I'd like to read tonight this poem, Getting Down to Get Over, which is dedicated to my mother and which I wrote 10 years ago and which is tonight dedicated to the people in Gretna, Virginia. <laughs> the poem goes like this. Mama, 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 mammy, nanny, granny, woman, sister, love, black girl, slave girl, gal, honey child, sweet stuff, sugar, sweetheart, baby, 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 mama, mama, Black mama, black bitch, black pussy piece of tail, nice piece of ass. Hey daddy, hey bro, we walk together and talk together and dance and do together, dance and do. Hey daddy, hey bro, hey Nina, Nikki, Noni, Nomo, Nomo, mama, black mama, black woman, black female head of household, black matriarchal matriarchy, black statistical low life, low level, low down, low down, and up to be black statistical, a low factor, factotum, factitious, fictitious, figment, figuring in low down, lying annual reports. Black woman, black, hallelujah, saintly, patient, smiling, humble, giving thanks for annual reports and monthly dole, and Friday night, and good God, Monday morning, black and female, martyr masochist, a big white lie, mama, mama. What does motherfucking mean? 
Who's the motherfucker? Fuck my mama, mess yours over and right now. Be tripping on my star, black female soul, a Mack truck motherfucker. The first primordial, the paradigmatic, dogmatistic motherfucker. Who is he? Hey, mama, 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 mama. Dry eyes on the shy, dark, hidden, crying black face of the loneliness, the rape, the broke up mailbox, and no Western Union roses come inside the kitchen, and no poem take you through the whole night. And no big black burly hand be holding yours to have to hold on to. No big black burly hand, no no mo. No black prince come riding from the darkness on a beautiful black horse. No bro, no daddy. I was 16 when I met my father in a bar in Baltimore. He told me who he was and what he does, paid for the drinks. I looked, I listened, and I left him. It was civil perfectly an absolute bullshit. The drinks was leaking water weak and never got down to my knees. Hey, Daddy, what they been and done to you and what you been and done to me too, Mama, Mama, Mama. Hey, Sugar Daddy, Big Daddy, Sweet Daddy, Black Daddy, the original Father Divine, the ever-loving, deep, tall, bad, buck, jive, cold, strut. The, I mean, the issue is, you know, what kind of society do we want to have and what role, what part of that society is the open communication between a writer and a reader? I mean, do we think that's important? And if we do think it's important, why? And if we do think it's important, what does that tell us about what we can and can't do? I mean, what does that tell us about how much we have to accept that we might not feel comfortable with? I mean, do we want books that we're com only books that we're comfortable with? I mean, what is, the, what is the price that we all pay for living in an open society? And is it worth it? And you're right, there are people being thrown in jail. This is in Argentina. And uh, sometimes the basis for the censorship is almost impossible to fully understand. And you look at the lists of books that are being censored and uh, that are being removed from school libraries. You almost want to go back and read them again to figure out what they saw that you missed. But it's a very important fight, the fight to keep society open. It's a very important fight, the fight to keep writers feeling confident and free and certain that the words that they send out to readers will actually reach those readers. And it's a fight that's never won. It's a fight that has to be renewed and renewed and renewed. Um, as you may have read in your programs, uh, Mary Poppins is not one of the books that has been banned for being uh, salacious. Um, <laughs> what I believe some of the southern ministers of the moral majority call flat-out schwitzik. Nobody has ever said that. It was, it was, um, it was banned, or it was removed from the shelves in San Francisco for having a stereotypical, or what was alleged to be a stereotypical presentation of African natives. When I read this, I realized that both of my own daughters had read the unexpurgated Mary Poppins. <laughs> um, it's now been revised, is what I mean. Um, they seem fine. I just wanted to put your mind at rest in case your kids have done the same thing. Uh, however, this passage seems to me somewhat suspicious on uh, chapter 13. Now, she said, spit spot into bed. And she began to undress them. They noticed that whereas buttons and hooks had needed all sorts of coaxing from Katie Nana, for Mary Poppins, they flew apart almost at a look. <laughs> in less than a minute, they found themselves in bed and watching by the dim light from the nightlight the rest of Mary Poppins' unpacking being performed. Mary Poppins, slipping one of the flannel nightgowns over her head, began to undress underneath it as though it were a tent. Michael, charmed by this strange new arrival, <laughs> unable to keep silent any longer, called to her. Mary Poppins, he cried, you'll never leave us, will you? There was no reply from under the nightgown. 
<laughs> Michael could not bear it. <laughs> you won't leave us, will you? He called anxiously. Mary Poppins' head came out of the top of the nightgown. She looked very fierce. One word more from that direction, she said threateningly, and I'll call the policeman. I was only saying, began Michael meekly, that we hoped you wouldn't be going away soon. He stopped, feeling very red and confused. Mary Poppins stared from him to Jane in silence. Then she sniffed. I'll stay till the wind changes, she said shortly, and she blew out her candle and got into bed. That's all right, said Michael, half to himself and half to Jane. But Jane wasn't listening. She was thinking about all that had happened and wondering. I'm going to read from Slaughterhouse Five, which has been banned in the, in the famous Island Trees School District, which we've heard so much about tonight. The reason the school board banned it was because Slaughterhouse Five is blasphemous and anti-Christian, and no one could think otherwise. <laughs> Billy Pilgrim padded downstairs on his blue and ivory feet. He went into the kitchen where the moonlight called his attention to a half bottle of champagne on the kitchen table, all that was left from the reception in the tent. Someone had stoppered it again. Drink me, it seemed to say. So Billy uncorked it with his thumbs. It didn't make a pop. The champagne was dead, so it goes. Billy looked at the clock on the gas stove. He had an hour to kill before the saucer came. He went into the living room, swinging the bottle like a dinner bell, turned on the television. He came slightly unstuck in time, saw the late movie backwards, then forwards again. It was a movie about American bombers in the Second World War and the gallant men who flew them. Seen backwards by Billy, the story went like this. American planes full of holes and wounded men and corpses took off backwards from an airfield in England. Over France, a few German fighter planes flew at them backwards, sucked bullets and shell fragments from some of the planes and crewmen. They did the same for wrecked American bombers on the ground, and those planes flew up backwards to join the formation. The formation flew backwards over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism which shrunk the fires, gathered them into cylindrical steel containers, and lifted the containers into the bellies of the planes. The containers were stored neatly in racks. The Germans below had miraculous devices of their own, which were long steel tubes. They used them to suck more fragments from, from the crewmen and planes. But there were still a few wounded Americans, though, and some of the bombers were in bad repair. Over France, though, German fighters came up again, made everything and everybody good as new. When the bombers got back to their base, the steel cylinders were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America, where factories were operating night and day, dismantling the cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. The minerals were then shipped to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground, to hide them cleverly, so they would never hurt anybody again. Notice the books that were banned in America. I mean, it, the, today's selection was, this evening's selection was a very interesting selection. It seems to me that what joins all these selections together is that they all deal with a kind of um, overthrow of our public professed morality. I mean, the Vonnegut section that I read of the bombs being sucked back into the bellies of the bombers, it's a very anti-war sentiment, but told in a very poetic and charming and almost whimsical way, imagining all the bombs going back into the earth, going, being transformed into their, into their elements, into their minerals. I think this is more frightening to groups like the moral majority than um, so-called pornography. Um, writing about sexual acts. In other words, what is re revolutionary about the Vonnegut thing or the Swift um, excerpt that was read tonight is that it sees the world in a radically different way. It says, we don't have to make bombs. We can return the bombs to their elements. Or we are eating children, as in, as in the Swift piece. What the censor objects to is the lonely individual seeing the world in a way that is not sanctioned by our public morality. And this is fascinating, because when we listen to the excerpts that were read tonight, none of them seem violently incendiary. 
And yet what is incendiary is the quirky, individualistic, and kind of crazy way of seeing the world. You can't legislate this out of existence. In the 19th century, I suppose the one figure whose memory reverberates most significantly and chillingly here tonight, particularly in view of what this recalls of that period, is the man who said, I unhesitatingly declare there is at present no more active agent employed by Satan in civilized communities to ruin the human family and subject the nations to himself than evil reading. That man was Anthony Comstock, who was responsible in 1873 for the passage of the Comstock Act, which, as Mr. Rembar has written, provided the model for most American obscenity statutes for many strenuously imaginative years to come. Into the present, two undeniable, I think, points. One, there are more attempts at censorship, particularly in school libraries, than at any time since the Joe McCarthy, Roy Cohn years. Why not give the living his due? Uh, <laughs> these attacks on books are taking place in one-fifth of the schools of this country. Half of these attempts succeed. And the most alarming statistic of all, in nearly 85% of these challenges to books, there is no local newspaper or broadcast coverage. Don't say anything, it never happened. From that keen desire to avoid trouble, comes a growing phenomenon. Uh, there are reports of, it, of its advent from Minnesota, certain parts of New York State, and in the South. Certain authors' new books are no longer ordered by school libraries, no matter what the reviews say, no matter how much interest the kids in the school. I'm being asked to read a, an excerpt from Bernard Malamud's The Fixer. <clears throat> it was banned in, uh, by the Board of Education of Island Trees, New York. <clears throat> And it was banned because it said that the book would be offensive to Jews. And the statement that uh, Bernard Mellon makes is a very strong statement about anti-Semitism. And the fact that, that the decision was based on that it would be offensive to Jews is ridiculous. God save us all from the bloody Jews, the boatman said as he rowed. Those long-nosed, pockmarked, cheating, blood-sucking parasites, they'd rob us of daylight if they could. They foul up earth and air with their body stink and garlic breaths, and Russia will be done to death by the diseases they spread unless we make an end to it. Day after day, they crap up the motherland, the boatman went on monotonously, and the only way to save ourselves is to wipe them out. I don't mean kill a jid now and then with a, a blow of the fist or a kick in the head, but wipe them all out, which we've sometimes tried but never done as it should be done. I say we ought to call our menfolk together, armed with guns, knives, pitchforks, clubs, anything that'll kill a Jew. And when the church bells begin to ring, we move on the jitty quarter. You can take my word, the time's not far off when everything I say we will do, because our Lord, who they crucified, wants his rightful revenge. He dropped an oar and crossed himself. Jakob fought an impulse to do the same. His bag of prayer things fell with a plop into the Dnieper and sank like lead. Now, an earlier band work, which still gets banned, or tries to get itself banned every time it's performed. The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare had the parents in Midland, Michigan, request that it be taught with supplementary reading to place its alleged anti-Semitism in historical context. The school board, however, went further, and over the protest of the parents, banned the play from classroom use altogether. I'll read two brief passages from it. Act three, scene one, Solerio and Shylock are speaking. Solerio, but tell us, do you hear whether Antonio have had any loss at sea or no? Hmm, there I have another bad match, a bankrupt, a prodigal, who dare scarce show his head on the Rialto, beggar that was used to come to so smug upon the mart. Let him look to his bond. He was one to call me usurer. Let him look to his bond. He was one to lend money for a Christian curtsy. Let him look to his bond. Why, I'm sure if he forfeit, thou wilt not take his flesh. What's that good for? T 
to bait fish withal. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million, laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargain, cooled my friends, heated mine enemies. And what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Hitler burnt books and used a phrase that's very interesting when he was condemning a certain kind of art in Munich. He said, uh, we have to get rid of the um, artistic criminal. In other words, the idea of an artist as a criminal because of the production of his art is an idea that I never heard before and since. In other words, it could be such a thing as an illegal song or an illegal book. And you have to understand that I come from a race of people for whom at one time in this country it was illegal to be taught to read. It was illegal and punishable by physical punishment and sometimes fatal punishment to learn how to read. And white people who taught black people how to read were taking the risk of being punished. So that is more than a secular event as far as I'm concerned. And I think the same um, sensibilities that informed those people to make it a criminal act for black people to read are the uh, ancestors of the same people who are making it a criminal act for their own children to read. And I don't see a great deal of difference between that. There is some hysteria associated with the idea of reading that is all out of proportion to what is, in fact, happens when one reads. The Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum was first banned from many public library systems in the 1920s. Most children's librarians felt that the Oz books had nothing of worth to offer to young readers, keeping the books off library shelves throughout the country. In 1957, the director of the Detroit Public Library System banned The Wizard of Oz for encouraging negativism and for generally being of no value. In some cases, controversy over the Oz book centered on its author, L. Frank Baum, who was falsely accused of being a communist. The Wizard of Oz has been reinstated in most public libraries today, but not all. The Wizard of Oz, Chapter 15, The Discovery of Oz, The Terrible. The four travelers, Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Woodman, and the Lion, walked up to the great gate of the Emerald City and rang the bell. After ringing several times, it was opened by the guardian of the gate. What? Are you back again? He asked in surprise. But I thought you'd gone to visit the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> well, we did visit her, said the Scarecrow. And she let you go again, asked the man in wonder. She could not help it. She's melted, <laughs> explained the Scarecrow. Melted? Who melted her? It was Dorothy, said the lion gravely. 
Good gracious, exclaimed the man, and he bowed very low before her. Promptly at nine o'clock the next morning, they all went into the throne room of the Great Oz. Of course, each one of them expected to see the wizard in the shape he'd taken before, and all were greatly surprised when they looked about and saw no one at all in the room. They kept close to the door and closer to one another, for the stillness of the empty room was more dreadful than any of the forms they had seen Oz take. Presently, they heard a voice seeming to come straight from the throne itself. I am Oz, the great and terrible. Why do you seek me? We, we've come to claim our promise, O Oz, Dorothy said. What promise, asked Oz. You promised to send me back to Kansas when the Wicked Witch was destroyed, said the girl. And you promised to give me brains, said the scarecrow. And you promised to give me a heart, said the tin woodman. And you promised to give me courage, said the cowardly lion. Is the Wicked Witch really destroyed? asked the voice. And Dorothy thought it trembled a little. Yes, she answered. I melted her with a bucket of water. Dear me, said the voice. <laughs> How sudden. Well, come to me tomorrow, for I must have time to think it over. You've had plenty of time already. You must keep your promise to us, claimed Dorothy. The lion thought it might be well to frighten the wizard, so he gave a large, loud roar, so fierce and dreadful that Toto jumped away from him in alarm and tipped over a screen that stood in a corner. As it fell with a crash, they saw a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face. The tin woodman, raising his axe, rushed to the little man and cried out, Who are you? I am Oz. And I thought Oz was a terrible beast, said the tin woodman. And I thought Oz was a ball of fire, said the lion. No, you are all wrong, said the little man meekly. I have been making believe. They agreed to say nothing of what they learned and went back to their rooms in high spirits. Even Dorothy had hoped that the great and terrible humbug, as she called him, would find a way to send her back to Kansas. And if he did that, she was willing to forgive him everything. Studs Turkle was not able to make it tonight. In Studs Turkle's place, it gives me pleasure to introduce to you now Thomas Patrick Gates, who was or is the fireman in Turkle's book, Working. Mr. Gates is now the Sergeant at Arms of the Uniform Firefighters Association of New York. Mr. I'd rather be in a fire now than be standing up here. When those bells went off before, I wanted to bail out of here. <laughs> City cops, they got clubs. They think they, they are the elite. Housing is housing authority. They call us the ha-ha cops. Transit cops are called cave cops because they are in the subway. These are little ribs they give. Who's better? Who's New York's finest? I was in a park three years ago with a transit cop. We were with these, these two nice looking girls. I was still single. It's about one o'clock in the morning. We had a couple of six packs and a pizza pie. We're trying to make out, right? Cops pull up, city cops, and they shine a light on us. So my friend shows the cop his badge. The cop says, that's more of the reason you shouldn't be here. You are fucking on a job. Just get the fuck out of the park. Because he was a transit cop that gave him a hard time. My friend was going after this cop, and this cop was going after him. I grabbed him, and the driver in the police car grabbed his buddy, and they were yelling, keep out of the park. And the other guy yelling, don't come down in the subways. I could have turned around and said, don't ever come in the housing projects. <laughs> It was stupid shit. A guy pulled out a gun and get killed. I don't think it's funny because this kind of mentality is the leaders of this country, but they don't play with 38s. They play with atomic bombs and neutron bombs. What led me to be a cop? I'm not, I'm not that smart to be a lawyer. A good day in school for me was when a teacher never, didn't call on me. <laughs> I used to sit down in the back of the room and slide down into the seat so she didn't call on me. When I got pimples on my face, that made it worse. I was shy. And I got glasses here. I was shy. This book was written 10 years ago. 
I was shy with girls. One thing I, I told my father, I'm going to kill myself. I got pimples. He said, I'll never forget it. The world's bigger than a pimple on your face. <laughs> At that time, I didn't think it was. I used to pile noxema on my face. And I was with a girl making out, and she'd say, I smell noxema. It used to be. <laughs> It used to be in my hair, up my nose. And when I smell Noxema today, I could still see your face. I like mathematics. I could, I could add like a bastard. I started getting into algebra, but then I got lost. I didn't want to raise my hand because I had the skin problem. It's crazy, right? I sunk down and the teacher never called on me for two years. And when she did call on me, it was just to leave the room. I didn't want to be a cop. Money comes into it. I was 26 and I worked in a post office and I wasn't making money, 218 an hour. I was young and I wanted to go out with the girls and I wanted to go down to the Jersey Shore. I wanted to buy a car. I just got out of the, out of the army. That's why I took it. When I became a cop, I thought I was going against my father. Cops are tools of the shit in Rockefeller. Cops can't understand when they build a new office building in Harlem. The people in our community want a hospital or a school. Rockefeller built that office building, right? Built by white construction workers and these people demonstrate. Suppose they built in this neighborhood a state office building and black people built it and black people worked in it. The cops go in there and break up the demonstrators. And who gets it? The cops. I took the fire department test in 68 and got called in 70. I always wanted to be a fireman. My older brother was a fireman 11 years. I like everybody working together. You chipping for a meal together. One guy goes to the store, one guy cooks, one guy washes the dishes. A common goal. We got a lieutenant there. He says the fire department is the closest thing to socialism there is. I was in a fire one night. We had an all hands fire, and all hands is is you got a working fire and you're the first one in there. And the first guy in there is gonna take the worst beating. You got the nozzle, the hose, you are taking a beating. If another company comes up behind you, you don't give up that nozzle. It's pride to put out a fire. We go over this with oxygen, tell the guy, get out, get oxygen. They won't leave. I think guys wanna be heroes. You can't be a hero on Wall Street. We had this fire down a block, a Puerto Rican social club. The captain and the other fireman took the ladder up and saved two people. But downstairs, there was a guy trying to get out the back door. They had bolts on the door. He was burnt dead. His fingernails had rotted down from trying to escape his way out. Know what the lieutenant said? We lost a guy. We lost a guy. I said, you saved two, two people. How would you know at 6 in the morning a guy in a social club sleeping on a pool table? He said, yeah, but we lost a guy. When I was a kid, we waved that fire. It's like a place in the sun. Last month, there was a second alarm. I was off duty. I ran over there. I'm a bystander. I see these firemen on the roof with the smoke pouring out around them and the flames, and they go in. It fascinated me. Jesus Christ, that's what I do. I was fascinated by the people's faces. You could see the pride that they were seeing. The fucking world's folk fucked up. The country's fucked up. But the firemen, you actually see them produce. You see them put out a fire. You see them come out with the babies in their hands. You see them give mouth to mouth when a guy's dying. You can't get around that shit. That's real. To me, that's what I want to be. I worked in a bank, you know? It's just paper. It's not real. Nine to five and it's shit. You're looking at numbers, but I can look back and say, I helped put out a fire. I helped save somebody. It shows something I did on this earth. Someone, I, I can't remember who, was putting out an anthology on young people and work. And uh, they wanted to use some, some, a couple of my stories. And they were friends of mine, even. And they said, well, oh, God, we can't do that. You know, you have those dirty words in there. We can't do it. No, I mean, even many, you know, like two for every five pages. <laughs> so, but the kids were talking, you know. So that happened. I, I never thought of it as censorship. I just thought, gee, maybe I can write a clean story for kids. <laughs> I don't think so. But, uh, but, but it was, again, it was about work, and it was really interesting how, how, um, how it, in order to be sold, in order for it to go into the textbook market, you see, it had to it had to meet these particular standards, so it couldn't it couldn't have it. But I had another another experience, which is which is the exact opposite, and the one that you should, you know, while we're talking about bad things, we should talk about good things too. Um, I I have one particular story that I wrote, which really has an awful lot of bad language in it. You know, it really it's about language. It talks about language, and it talks about these kids and how they begin to speak. And, and the kind of language that they use. And I was uh, reading at a, uh, at a Catholic college in uh, Minneapolis, at St. Catharines, and the uh, nun who was in charge said to me, um, would you read that story? It's called A Gloomy Tune, in case you ever want to look it up. Anyway, it's called, <laughs> she said, would you read that? She said, I always liked that story, Grace. I said, oh, geez, I can't read that story. It's got so many dirty words in it. 
And she said, uh, this nun said, she said, well, I read it to my class this afternoon, so I think you can. So I said, yes, I can, and I will, and I did. <laughs> my pleasure to be able to read to you from what was, as near as we can tell, the first act uh, of a great novel, and a novel that's been unpopular with censors for 132 years. That's how long ago The Scarlet Letter was published, and it's been on various banned books lists ever since. It fits two of the most prevailing categories of banned books. It can be viewed as unflattering to our country in a period of our history, and it exposes a subject that many people wish didn't exist, a subject at least that some censors don't want younger people being exposed to, namely adultery, which is related, even younger people might guess, to sex. <laughs> so on two counts, unflattering to Americans and having to do with sex, Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter is still being censored. It is ironic that a novel in part about the self-righteousness of the accusers of the Puritan world should draw the fire of the self-righteous accusers of today. That he should still have enemies among the self-righteous should make Hawthorne in his grave very proud. The very short passage from Hawthorne I want to read is actually from the story Endicott and the Red Cross, written in 1837. It was, most people agree, the first act of his imagination that led him to write the Scarlet Letter. It describes a typical Puritan midday in the shadow of that humorless house of prayer, much as Bruegel might have painted it. In close vicinity to the sacred edifice appeared that important engine of Puritanic authority, the whipping post, with the soil around it well trodden by the feet of evildoers who had there been disciplined. At one corner of the meeting house was the pillory, and at the other the stocks, and by singular good fortune for our sketch, the head of an Episcopalian and suspected Catholic was grotesquely encased in the former machine, while a fellow criminal who had boisterously quaffed a health to the king was confined by the legs in the latter. Side by side on the meeting house steps stood a male and a female figure, the man was a tall, lean, haggard personification of fanaticism, bearing on his breast this label, a wanton gospeler, which betokened that he had dared to give interpretations of holy writ unsanctioned by the infallible judgment of the civil and religious rulers. His aspect showed no lack of zeal, even at the stake. The woman wore a cleft stick on her tongue inappropriate retribution for having wagged that unruly member against the elders of the church, and her countenance and gestures gave much cause to apprehend that the moment the stick should be removed, a repetition of the offense would demand new ingenuity for chastising it. The above-mentioned individuals had been sentenced to undergo their various modes of ignominy for the space of one hour at noonday, but among the crowd were several whose punishment would be lifelong, some whose ears had been cropped like those of puppy dogs, others whose cheeks had been branded with the initials of their misdemeanors, one with his nostrils slit and seared, and another with a halter about his neck which he was forbidden ever to take off or to conceal beneath his garments. I think he must have been grievously tempted to affix the other end of the rope to some convenient beam or bow. There was likewise a young woman with no mean share of beauty, whose doom it was to wear the letter A on the breast of her gown in the eyes of all the world and her own children. And even her own children knew what that initial signified. Sporting with her infamy, the lost and desperate creature had embroidered the fatal token in scarlet cloth with golden thread and the nicest art of needlework so that the capital A might have been thought to mean admirable 
or anything rather than adulterous. But let not the reader argue from any of these evidences of iniquity that the times of the Puritans were more vicious than our own. Who would argue with that? A modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burden to their parents or the country and for making them beneficial to the public. It is a melancholy object to those who walk through this great town of Dublin when they see the streets crowded with beggars of the female sex, followed by three, four, or six children, all in rags and importuning every passenger for an arms. I think it is agreed by all parties that this prodigious number of children in the arms or on the backs or at the heels of their mothers and frequently of their fathers is in the present deplorable state of the kingdom a very great additional grievance and therefore whoever could find out a fair, cheap and easy method of making these children sound and useful members of the commonwealth would deserve so well of the public as to have his statue set up for a preserver of the nation. Now, I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well-nursed, is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food. <laughs> Whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or ragu. <laughs> I do therefore humbly offer it to public consideration that 100,000 at a year old be offered in sale to the persons of quality and fortune through the kingdom, always advising the mother to let them suck plentifully in the last month so as to render them plump and fat for a good table. I think the advantages by the proposal which I have made are obvious and many as well as of the highest importance. It would greatly lessen the number of papists with whom we are yearly overrun. The poorer tenants will have something valuable of their own. The constant breeders, besides the gain of eight shillings sterling per annum by the sale of their children, will be rid of the charge of maintaining them after the first year. <laughs> We shall soon see an honest emulation among the married women. Which of them could bring the fattest child to market? Men would become as fond of their wives during their time of pregnancy as they are now of their mares in foal or their cows in calf, nor offer to beat or kick them as it is too frequent a practice for fear of miscarriage. I can think of no one objection that will possibly be raised against this proposal, unless it should be urged that the number of people will be thereby much lessened in the kingdom. This I freely own, and it was indeed one principal design. As you can see, writers of all kinds are very concerned with censorship. I think Native Americans are particularly concerned with censorship for several reasons. Let's recall that it was uh, not too many centuries ago that we invited in late November a bunch of people to dinner. And immediately thereafter, all the historians present decided to claim that uh, we weren't the hosts and they weren't the guests. So it's been downhill for us ever since then. <laughs> the censors that we faced were called missionaries rather than librarians, but the end result was pretty much the same. We begin to confuse equality and conformity. We begin to think that all of us must agree upon ideas in order to live in peace. In 1934, or until 1934, and the Reorganization Act, Native Americans were effectively censored out of existence by a federal viewpoint which prohibited the speaking of native languages, the teaching of native languages, the painting of any ceremonies or dances, the performance of such religious acts, or the wearing of the regalia, which is central to the 
ceremonies, religious and otherwise, of Native people. We diminish ourselves when we believe that we must teach them, other people, a truth which exists for us, which may not work, nor be a rational, nor an imaginative part of the world of other people. A Farewell to Arms, Ernest Hemingway's tale about love and death and World War I along the Italian front, was labeled a filthy, trashy sex novel by a Baptist minister in upstate New York in 1980. He attempted to ban the book in his community, being apparently unappeased by the fact that a wrathful God in the final chapter takes not only the life of the heroine, the British nurse who has fallen in love with the convalescing American ambulance driver, but who also oversees the death of the child born of that romance, that romance that was unsanctified by the clergy. I remember as a, as a young man, as an altar boy in, in, in a Catholic church, sitting on the side of the altar during the sermon, when the priest in the 1940s would tell the parish what it could and what it couldn't read. It was a time, the 1940s, when the church was extremely strong in determining what was permissible in literature, in films. And I would sit listening to the priest reading from the list, our local index, saying that Forever Amber, the novel was, and film, were forbidden. Books by Hemingway in those days were forbidden, at least in my parish. And many of the magazines, what would now be called the men's magazines, in their rather tame form in the 1940s, the nudist magazines, were most assuredly forbidden. And the church of, of, of my youth, the 1940s, early 50s, was carrying on a tradition of censorship that had certainly been part of the church and so many other religions as well since the Middle Ages. And I see now in the 1980s forms of censorship, be it the moral majority or, or others who pretend to be virtuous. I see this as very much medieval. And it's astonishing how in the 1980s the Dark Ages lives on in certain parts of America. Nat Hintoff has told you something of the circumstances uh, and pseudo reasons uh, surrounding the several bannings of Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn various places in the country recently. I would like now merely to give you uh, a reminder of the flavor of the book. Huck and Jim are on the river, on the raft. Huck is speaking. Two or three days and nights went by. I reckon I might say they swum by. They slid around so quiet and smooth and lovely. Here is the way we put in the time. It was a monstrous big river down there, sometimes a mile and a half wide. We run nights and laid up and hid daytimes. Soon as night was most gone, we stopped navigating and tied up, nearly always in the dead water under a towhead. And then cut young cottonwoods and willows and hid the raft with them. Then we set out the lines. Next, we slid off into the river and had a swim so as to freshen up and cool off. Then we sat down on the sandy bottom where the water was about knee deep and watched the daylight come. The first thing to see, looking away over the water, was a kind of dull line. That was the woods on the other side. You couldn't make nothing else out. Then a pale place in the sky, then more paleness spreading around. Then the river softened up away off and weren't black anymore, but gray. You could see little dark spots drifting along ever so far away, trading scows and such things, and long black streaks, rafts. Sometimes you could hear a sweep squeaking or jumbled up voices. It was so still, and the sounds come so far. And by and by, you could see a streak on the water, which you knew by the look of it, that there's a snag there in a swift current which breaks on it and makes that streak look that way. And you could see the mist curl up from the river and the east reddening up. And you could make out a log cabin in the edge of the woods 
away on the bank on the other side, being a wood yard, likely, and piled up by them sheets so thin you could throw a dog through it anywhere. Once there was a thick fog, and the rafts and things that went by was beating tin pans so the steamboats wouldn't run over them. A scow or a raft went by so close we could hear them talking and cussing and laughing, hear them playing, but we couldn't see no sign of them. It made you feel crawly. It was like spirits carrying on that way in the air. Jim said he believed it was spirits, but I says no spirits wouldn't say, "Dern the darn fog. <laughs> Sometimes we'd have that whole river all to ourselves for the longest time. Yonder was the banks and the islands across the water, and maybe a spark, which was a candle in a cabin window. And sometimes on the water, you could see sparks too, on a raft or a scow. And maybe you could hear a fiddle or a song coming over from one of them craft. It's lovely to live on a raft. We had the sky up there all speckled with stars. And we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened. Jim, he allowed they was made, but I allowed they happened. I judged it would have took too long to make so many. Jim said the moon could have laid them like eggs. Well, that looked kind of reasonable, so I didn't say nothing against it, because I've seen a frog lay most as many. So, of course, it could be done. We used to watch the stars that fell too and see them streak down. Jim allowed they'd got spoiled and was hove out of the nest. It's lovely to live on a raft. Brings in variety and forbids the appetite to fail. In some, do not insult me with the beheadings, finger choppings, or the lung deflations you planned for my works. I need my head to shake or nod, my hand to wave or make into a fist, my lungs to shout or whisper with. I will not go gently unto a shelf, degutted to become a non-book. All you umpires, back to the bleachers, Referees, hit the shower. It's my game. I pitch, I hit, I catch, I run the bases. At sunset, I've won or lost. At sunrise, I'm out again, giving it the old try. And no one can help me, not even you. Thank you.